1 Corinthians 16. We've been making our way through 1 Corinthians, and we are now today beginning the last chapter of 1 Corinthians. Just to give you a preview, next we're going into the book of Judges. 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 And then after that, we'll go to 2 Corinthians, you know, in the future. But today, we're in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. We're just going to do the first four verses of this chapter because they all are about the same thing, which is giving. And we'll talk about this, and, and I'll, we're going to pull some principles out of this. But let's read this together. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also you are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've written us a book that we can read and understand and learn about who you are and what you're doing and how you want us to live. Lord, today as we talk about giving and generosity, we ask that you would, you would bless us with this. God, that you would open our, our minds to, to understand what it is to truly give and what kind of giving you want from us and what kind of giving you don't want from us. Lord, today, help us to become more generous. God, as we study this together, as I preach, I ask for your blessing on me that what I say would be helpful and true and encouraging, convicting, challenging, where it needs to be, Lord, but kind and full of love because these are my brothers and sisters whom I love. We ask your blessing on this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This is an odd little passage. And if we weren't going all the way through 1 Corinthians, I might have been tempted just to skip this one. But the truth is that as I've been studying this and reading this this week, I really think that there are some important principles for giving that we see right here in this text. And we're going to pull those out. They all take place in verse 2. But verses 1 and 3 and 4 are a context that helps us to understand what was going on and why they were making a collection at all. So in Jerusalem at this time, because remember, this, this letter is being written to Corinth, people who are in the city of Corinth, which was a, it was a province there. And there was a church in Jerusalem as well. There were lots of churches. There was another church in Galatia. There were actually many churches in Galatia. Notice all the, the letters that we have in the New Testament are written to churches. And they were all in different places. And, and you find some overlap in some of these stories that were taking place during this time. And this is one of them, that the church in Jerusalem was being horribly persecuted. Um, they were being killed, not just by the Romans, but by the Jews. The Jews didn't like the Christians there. Um, they were poor because a lot of them had lost their jobs. They couldn't work or people wouldn't trade with them because they were Christians. And so they were incredibly poor. In our day and age, when we talk about somebody being poor, what we usually mean is, well, they don't have all the nice stuff that everybody else has. But if you were poor in the first century, uh, you were starving and you didn't have clothes enough to keep you warm in the cold. And you didn't have enough food. And so that's what was going on. The, the Jerusalem church was starving. They were in real poverty and need. And not only were they being persecuted and in need, they were also just generally hated. And so there was very little support that they were receiving from anybody else. And so here is what Paul says to the Corinthians. Remember, for the last 15 chapters, he's just been letting them have it about all the ways that they failed. And now he, he makes this appeal to them. Hey guys, we're going to take up a collection for the saints who are in Jerusalem for your brothers and sisters. Now he doesn't say that there, but that's included that these are your brothers and sisters in the family of God. And we're going to help take care of them. Notice it's not an ask, really. He says, here's how we're going to do it. And then in verse 2, he lays out the plan. We'll get to that in a second. But I want you to see in verse 3 and 4 as well, lest we skip these, that these were real letters to real people. This is not just like a bullet list of here's all the things you should believe and do. These were real people that received this letter. And so he says, hey, when I get there, 
I'll take the collection and I'll, and I'll send those whom you have chosen, who you trust with this money, and they'll go to Jerusalem. And if you want me to go with them, then I will. That's what he says here. And we might think that that's strange for like the great theologian and pastor, but he was also just a guy, right? And, and they had to figure out how they were going to handle the money because this would have been a lot of money. This would have been money that was probably collected over like eight, nine months, a year. Every week, that's a lot of money. And so Paul says, let's make sure we send the right guys with all this cash. Um, because if we send, you know, one of these guys that's been trying to destroy the church and he just takes the money, we never see him again. Then the people in Jerusalem aren't helped. Now we feel bad. He says, look, we're going to send some guys by letter. Okay. All right. Now here's the meat of it. Here's what I really want us to spend some time on is verse two. Verse two. In verse two, we see, I think, five principles of giving. Now notice this giving in particular is giving to the poor, giving to those who are in need. And I think that probably most of our giving as Christians is going to be focused in that direction, or at least a lot of it, on meeting needs, on, on those who are poor and who don't have the basic needs for life or who are just happen to be in need in a moment or need something for their kids or for their health or whatever it may be. But there are other kinds of giving as well, right? We can give our time. We can give our talent. We can give of ourselves. Sometimes what people need and what we really need to give them is just to go sit with them for a while or to just spend some time hanging out or, hey, I have this skill. I can help you fix your car or whatever. All of these things are ways that we can give. So it's not just giving to the poor. It's also, there's also giving to the church, right? Giving to the church. Now this passage is not particularly about that, but I think these principles apply to all of our giving. And I'll show you what I mean here. So verse two, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. Each of these phrases I think has a principle for us in giving. Here's the first one. Number one, giving should be regular. Giving should be regular. He says on the first day of every week. Notice he doesn't say, hey, in a year I'm coming, be ready, set your gift up, and then I'll get it then. No, he says on the first day of every week, set something aside. Giving should be regular. It's not the kind of thing where we say, well, I already gave this year, so I got, I'll just wait until 2019 and I'll give some more. No, it's just a regular thing. This is a habit that we should be in. That's the blank there. God wants me to make a habit of giving. That's what it means to give regularly. But this is something that we do consistently. Could be on the first day of every week. Some people give on Sundays. I think that's good. That's a good, that's a biblical practice. But it doesn't have to be. It could be, hey, here's this other thing that I give to regularly. It doesn't have to always be the church Although you should be giving to the church. If you don't think we're going to handle your money well, go somewhere else, honestly. Because if you don't trust us, if you can't give to us, if you don't trust us with your money, then don't trust us with our theology either, probably. Right? Okay. So God wants me to make a habit of giving. That's the idea here. It's not just a one-time thing. This is a, a pattern of life for the Christian. That's pretty straightforward. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time there. Here's number two. Number two, every Christian should give. Every Christian should give. Now, again, like I said, it could be all kinds of things that we give. And we'll talk about this in a minute. It may not, you may not have money to give. And that's okay, but you all have something to give, right? And every Christian should give. That's what he says here. Each of you, each of you on the first day of every week, each of you put something aside. Matthew 5, 42, Jesus says this. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, he gives this command in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 to thousands of people, not just the disciples, but to tons of people who were gathered there with him. So this command, I think we could say, easily applies to everybody. Even if we're going to say, hey, this, this passage here in 1 Corinthians 16, that was just for this specific gift at this specific time. We definitely see that every Christian should be giving no matter what. We should give. Christians give. 
Christians should give. Every Christian should give. That's just part of it. Let's look at Proverbs 21, 25 through 26. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day long he craves and craves, but the righteous gives and does not hold back. So in other words, he said there, there's a kind of person that all they do is they want, and they never do anything. But he says the righteous person, they work, and they do, and they have, and they give, and they don't hold back. So every Christian should give. Really, every person should give, but particularly every Christian should give. Now, here's number three. Let's look at number three. Giving should be intentional. Giving should be intentional. Notice what he says. Put something aside and store it up. In other words, plan for giving. God wants me to plan for giving. Now, again, you could do this thing where you, you kind of give as you go. You fly by and you see a need and you see somebody on the side of the road and they're begging for money and you give them five bucks. That's good. Do that. That's right. But also there should be giving that we plan for because the truth is what we plan for, we actually do. If you plan for giving, you end up actually giving. If you don't plan for giving, you may give a little bit, but you won't give as much as you wanted to. And you probably won't end up giving as much as you should. So giving should be intentional and we should plan for giving. One of the things that Katie and I do every month is we have a budget. So at the beginning of every month, we lay out, okay, here's what we have. Here's the bills that are going to come due. We have to pay these. Um, and then here's how we're going to give. This is the money that we already have planned to give to the church, to give to other ministry that's going on. And then we also set aside some money just to give gifts as we, as we need to. And that's going to be different for every person. And we'll get there in a second. But the idea is that we set aside giving intentionally. Because what happens is if you spend all your money, you can't give to anyone. You may see a need and say, oh man, your heart might be right. I really want to give to this person or to this ministry or to this need. And you can't because you don't have anything set aside. So what I would encourage you to do is whatever that looks like for you, set aside something, whether it's some time, if that's all you've got, or a little bit of money and say, this money I'm going to put in this place to give, or this is the money that I'm going to give to the church this month so that you know this is, this is how I'm going to do it. That's a biblical principle to set things aside. And it's also just a practical idea. I forget the author's name, but there's a guy who suggests something he calls the God pocket. He calls it his God pocket, where he sets aside a hundred dollars or so every month, and he puts it in a specific place in his wallet. He says, this is not mine to spend. This is God's to spend. And so he says, as he meets, as he meets people who have a need or sees somebody and he says, you know, I could meet this need in Jesus name. Then he's got that set there so that he can do that. And I think that's a cool idea as well. The idea here though, be intentional, set something aside to give because every Christian should be giving and giving should be intentional. Here's number four. This one's really important. And we're going to spend a little extra time here. Giving should be according to ability. Giving should be done according to ability. Now, here's what I mean. Paul says, as he may prosper. So on the first day of every week, each of you put something aside, store it up, as he may prosper. In other words, God doesn't lay down a blanket amount and say, here's the amount you should give. That's not like that. That was the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, there was some of that. This is the offering you bring. This is what you give to the Levites. This is what you give to the poor. You do this, check it off, you're good. That was the law. Now what we do is we give in the spirit. We are free from the law. Now, if, if you're under the conviction that that would be a tithe, right? That would be a percentage of your income, right? That would be part of that as he may prosper. Or as I'm more convinced, the tithe is a great place to start, but God asks us, the question in the Christian life is not, how much do I have to give? It's how much can I give? And maybe for some of you, you literally, you don't have 10% to give. Pay your bills first, but then maybe consider, are these bills, are these things that I have to pay? If it's rent or a car payment, the answer is probably yes. But sometimes we say, well, this is a bill when really this is money that I just waste. And 
that's between you and God. And again, I'm not going to say, hey, show me your budget and we're going to, I'm going to punish you if you're wrong. It's not like that. But giving should be according to your ability. That's what we're going to be judged by God on is our ability to give and then how we actually do it. So that, for example, if you're a kid and you have, you get $5 a month, your ability to give is going to be a lot smaller. Whereas if you make, you know, $400,000 a year, your ability to give is way bigger. Look, look at what Jesus says in Mark 12. Mark 12, 41 through 44. It's right there in your notes. It says, he sat down, this is Jesus, he sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Now in the temple in those days, there was the, it was this big horn. There were several of these big horns. And what you would do is you would put your money in the horn and it would like funnel it down into the treasury where then the, the priests would go in and they would count it and gather it and spend it as needed. And so people would come and they'd put it into the, the horn. And many rich people would go and put in large sums, it says. And what they would do, we know from other places, is that they would come in and bring like big old bags of change. So imagine if I'm bringing my offering and it's a couple hundred dollars and I say, I want everybody to think I'm a big spender. So I'm going to gather, I'm going to get it all in quarters. So I'm going to bring in just this big old sack of quarters and I'm going to slowly dump it in this big bronze horn so that everybody can hear. Look how generous he is. And so people are doing that. And, you know, I'm sure that people know who the rich people are and they're applauding them and they're excited. And they're like, wow, look at all this money he's giving. And then verse 42 it says, a poor widow came and put two small copper coins, which equaled a penny. So she just like sneaks in the back. All this fanfare and excitement and, you know, people are like making it rain into the offering box. And this widow comes in and she puts her two, her two pennies in. And Jesus pulls the disciple aside and he said, don't look at these idiots. Look at this lady. Look what she's doing. He says, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The idea is that God wants you to give what you can. Like I said, God is not looking at you and saying, if you don't give this much, you're not as holy as this other person. It's not like that. God says, where's your heart at? Remember what Jesus says, store up treasure in heaven where moth and rust won't destroy and where thieves won't break in and steal. He says, because... Where your treasure is, is where your heart is. And that goes the other way too. Where your heart is, is where your treasure ends up. God wants me to give what I can. That's the blank there. God wants me to give what I can. What I can. And then there's the other thing. We all have something to give. I have something to give. Whether it's time or talent or treasure. I like those three T's. Time or talent or treasure. We all have something to give. And some of us have more to give than others. Right? If you have to work 60 hours a week, you don't have a lot of time to give. It's just honest. You, you just don't. But if, if God has blessed you and you don't have to work at all, you have more time to give. And like I said, not just to the church, but to, to those in need and to good causes. God wants us to give to... God's kingdom is bigger than just the church. Let me just say that. Now, the church is God's most important project. The gospel is God's most important project. But Jesus, Jesus was also a healer, right? Jesus did not have to heal a single person. What do you think about that? He could have just walked around and preached the gospel. That would have been fine. But Jesus had compassion and he healed people as he went. And he fixed things and he gave. Jesus was a, was a healer and a fixer and he, a demon caster outer right? These were things that he didn't have to do. But I think what he did there is show us that God's kingdom is a little bit bigger than just preaching the gospel. It's not less than that. We must preach the gospel. But that you can do kingdom work in Jesus' name, and that might be cleaning somebody's, somebody's kitchen for them, right? Or that might be doing chores for free if you're a kid. That might be whatever it looks like where you give and you don't have to, but you do it because you love people and you do it because God wants you to and because you want people to know God and you want people to see that, man, Jesus is more valuable to me than my time or my treasure or my whatever. That, that's why we give and, and it's bigger than just, it's bigger than just preaching the gospel, God's kingdom. It's not less than that. Let me say that again, but it is more than that. 
Here's number five. Giving should be voluntary. Giving should be voluntary. Notice the last part of verse two here. He says, so that there will be no collecting when I come. I think what Paul is getting at here, and I could be wrong, but I I really do, as we read more of the way that Paul talks about giving, that he he didn't want the people there to feel compelled to give. Because the apostle Paul was a big deal. He's the one who's writing 1 Corinthians. He was a big deal. People knew him. They were like, oh man, Paul's here. And so he knew, hey, if if we wait until I get there, people are going to come and they're going to give because they want to impress me or because they want me, they want them, they want me to think, wow, look at this, this generosity. He says, no, 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 do it before I get there. I don't want to know who gave what. It didn't want it to be compelled. Look at first or second Corinthians nine, seven. It's in your notes. Second Corinthians nine, seven. He says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. In other words, the attitude of your heart when you give determines the value of your gift to God. I could give a million dollars because I want people to think that I'm great and God doesn't care a lick for that. Or I could be like the the poor widow who came and I voluntarily give my two cents and God says, man, her heart is so right. I love that. That's the gift that God wants. It should be voluntary. You may notice when we do the offering, I close my eyes and I pray because I don't want you to think, oh, pastor's watching me. I better give what, you know, <laughs> it's not like that. I don't, I don't want you to do that. It's voluntary. I want you to give to God out of your own heart out of a a desire to please him and to build his kingdom and to give to his work, not because you think that I want you to do that. I do want you to do that. And we'll talk about why here in a minute, but it's not about that. It's not about the amount. It's about the heart. And so giving should be voluntary. Here's the blank there. God wants me to choose to give. God wants me to choose to give. It's not like paying taxes, right? Taxes, I don't know if you know this. I hope you do. They're not voluntary. If you decide, you know, I don't really feel like paying my taxes this year, they will find you. They will find you. And they will double it, and they will beat you, and they will take what is theirs. That's not what God does. God says, hey, by the way, it's all mine. If I want it, I'll come get it. I want you to give it voluntarily. I want it because it, it does something for me when I give. And it does something for God when I give. And it does something for others when I give, if I give with the right motives. God makes it easy for people. That's right. That's right. All right. I just realized that your notes next say three biblical motives for giving. That's the blank. Three biblical motives for giving, but it's actually four. I wrote that heading and then I added a fourth one. <laughs> there are four biblical motives for giving. And we're going to add a bonus fifth one as well. <laughs> So just cross that three out because that's not right. There are actually lots of biblical motives for giving, but this, this is not a complete list. It's not a complete list. Just like this above is not really, it's not necessarily a complete list of all the things, but it's a good, good foundation, a good starting point. Okay, so four biblical motives for giving. Here's the first one. Giving meets the needs of others. It meets the needs of others. This is compassion, right? That I see somebody in need and I, I, I want to meet that need. I see somebody, hey, they're hungry. I want them to not be hungry anymore. I see them and they're thirsty. I want them to not be thirsty anymore. Look look at verse 34. Excuse me, Matthew 25, 34 to 36. The king will say to those on his right, that's God, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the the people respond and they say, well, when did we ever give to you, Lord? And he says, whenever you give to the least of these, you've given to me. Notice here though, that the motive for these people that God is gonna gonna praise at the end of time is that they just wanted to meet the need. They just saw somebody thirsty and said, this person needs some water. I saw somebody hungry and said, well, they need some food. 
or saw somebody that was a stranger and they said, come sit with us, right? The, the motive there was just to meet the need. But here's number two, giving will be rewarded by God. Giving will be rewarded by God. That's a biblical motive. I don't know if you know that or not. It's okay to give knowing that God will reward you. Now, the reward will not be physical on this earth, probably. It might be. But God rewards in a spiritual way. God rewards for eternity. Giving in Jesus' name is always an investment toward eternity. Always. You could say it was, uh, I've heard this said, that it's a, it is a currency exchange. You trade earthly treasure for heavenly treasure. Look at Matthew 16, 19 through 20. It's there in your notes. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on heaven. That's wrong. It's Matthew 6. Goodness gracious. Did I read these? Matthew 6, 19 through 20. That's right. Matthew 6, 19 through 20 says, build up for yourselves treasure in heaven, which we quoted already, where moth and rust cannot destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be. God rewards those who give to him and who give in his name. God rewards. Here's number three. Giving glorifies God. Giving glorifies God. Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That when we give, and notice the context here, giving glorifies God because it's included in the good works. Chapter 5, this part of chapter 5 of Matthew is all about that treasure in heaven. And then the end of Matthew 6 is also about treasure in heaven. It's about giving and, and being sacrificial. And so that, that we would include giving in the good works. So that when people see us give, or they know that we're a generous kind of person, Jesus says, then they'll see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So the giving glorifies God. Now he does go on to say as well that we shouldn't give in a way that is loud and um, that draws attention to ourselves because the point is to glorify God, to meet the need. It's not so that we look good. I'm going to say that a lot of times because it's so important. We don't give so that we look good. We give to meet needs, to glorify God, to be rewarded by God. When, we, when I give, it's between me and the person I give to, or even better, if I can, I want it to be between me and God. If I can give in a way that they don't even know that I gave, I like that better. Because sometimes, this is just a practical aside here, sometimes when you give to somebody, you give them a lot of money, or you give them something really important, it can change your relationship with them. And that's not always a bad thing, right? If your heart's right, that's not, always, that's not always wrong. But the truth is that the more quietly we can give, the better, the better. Because, again, like I said, that's a biblical principle there in Matthew 6, that when we give quietly, he says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He says, then your father who sees all things done in secret, he will reward you. So we want to give quietly to glorify God. Now, if people know that you give, that's not a bad thing. Like we said, that also glorifies God. But don't give so that people will know you give, if that makes sense. Okay. Here's number four. Giving is good for my soul. Giving is good for my soul. Look at Acts 20, 35. It's there in your notes. It's the second one, actually. In all things I have shown you, that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. It's really important because our, our world loves to receive, right? The, every commercial you see on TV says, you deserve to get stuff. And Jesus said, it's way better to give it. Way better to give it. Now, there's nothing wrong with receiving. Let me just tell you that. Don't, there's in this opposite thing that you can get into where you say, I never want to get anything from anybody. And that can be good where you say, I want to make sure that I work for what I have. But it can also be bad where you say, I can handle it on my own. I don't need anybody's help. The Bible calls that pride. And that's dangerous. It's bad. 
for your soul, but it is good for your soul to give. It's good to give in ways that are sacrificial as well. Something happens when you give to other people where your grip on this world gets loosened just a little bit. And the truth is that all of us are, are gripping pretty tightly to the world at any given time. Part of what we're trying to do as Christians is to kind of loosen that grip, to, to get less in love with the world and more in love with Jesus. And when I say, man, I'm willing to give this up for somebody else or for God's glory. What happens is I love the world less and I start to love Jesus more. It's good for my soul. But here's the other thing. Riches and money and just having lots of stuff and even having lots of time or being really, really good at something isn't bad, but it can be dangerous. Look at 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10 there. It says, those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation, into a trap, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It's through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is. Maybe you thought that the Bible said that money was the root of all evil. It's not. It's the love of money. And those are two different things. I can have lots of money and not be in love with it. Or I can have lots of money and it's my favorite thing in the world. Notice the difference. And that's something that we all have to struggle with because we're rich. I'm just going to tell you that. In America, we're rich. If you, if you go other places in the world, you realize pretty fast, we've got it really well here. Man, I get to wake up in the morning and I turn the sink on and water comes out. Wow. Most places in the world, they don't have that. Or I get to go to the bathroom inside. Amazing. Or I have money to pay my bills. How great is that? Right? If you're making it, <laughs> you're doing well. God, God is blessing you. You're rich. And it's easy to begin to love your money more than you love God. Now, money is necessary. We need it to live. It's a tool, though. It's not, a, it's not an end in itself. It's not like points, right? I don't know if you've, if you've ever played like an old arcade game where the, 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 the idea is you're just trying to get as many points as you can. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says don't earn points in money. Money is not worth points. Heavenly treasure is worth points. Giving good works, that is worth points points in God's kingdom. Now, the points don't save you, right? It's not that we are trying to earn good things. When I say that a giving is good for my soul, it's not that I need to save myself by giving. It's not like that. Jesus says you need to save yourself or you need to be saved by receiving. Here's number five, the bonus that I didn't include here. We give because God gave. We give because God gave. John 3, 16, everybody knows this. God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. We give because God gave. When I give, if I do it in Jesus' name, it's me saying, I want to be more like God and so I'm going to give. Because everything that God is is what's good and right and true. And so when God gives, it's good. And when I give because I want to be like him, it's good. And the ultimate gift that all of us have received is Jesus Christ. Now, the question is whether or not you've actually received him or not. Right? Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin, the payment for sin, what we deserve from sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we receive that gift of Jesus Christ by faith. Again, we don't earn it. We don't work for it. It's the opposite of pride. It is when we humble ourselves and say, God, I can't, I can't save me. I'm full of sin. I deserve to die. But you have saved me. You have died for me. You have given me your son so I can have eternal life. So as we give, we glorify God. But the main thing is that as we give, we want to remember the one who was given for us, the one who gave himself for us, and that's Jesus and then as we trust in him, we become more generous as well. 
That's not listed as one of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, but it is listed several other places that those who are in Christ are givers. We give. All right. So here's the closing thought. How much do you give is not the question. The question is, what is your heart like when you give? Or are you the kind of person who says, well, I don't, I'm not going to give anything because it's all mine. That's a bad place to be. Get your heart right with God. What are the needs that you know around you right now? That's the other thing. Think about that. Just what are the needs that you know right now? It could be something that nobody else knows about. If you're able to meet that need, and it would be good to meet that need, how can you meet, then, then think about, how can I meet that need? Right, if, if you know, hey, this person is not going to have enough food this week, how, if you can meet that need, meet it in Jesus' name. Be, be that person who gives. What are the needs around you? If you can give, give. It's good for you. It glorifies God. It's good for them. The more we give, the better the world becomes. The more glory God gets. Let's pray. God, we love you. And we thank you for your great love for us. God, we thank you that you gave your son so that we could have life. Lord, help us as we trust in him, as we look to him, as our savior, as the only one who could save us from our sins, as the one who gave everything for us. Lord, help us to be the kind of people who give like Christ gave, who are willing to sacrifice for those around us, who are willing to give what we can to those in need because you have given us everything. Lord, this morning as we get ready to go, I ask that you would begin to convict us where we might have failed in the past. Lord, help us to repent, to turn away from, from those failures to give or whatever sin may be holding us down. Help us to turn away from those things toward Jesus. And Lord, as we trust in him to begin to live lives that glorify you, to give in a way that glorifies you, to be holy in a way that glorifies you. God, we're here on this earth because you have made us and you have loved us enough to let us live and now you have given us heaven and the riches of heaven and all the glory that we don't deserve because of Jesus Christ. God, we are grateful for that this morning. We know that we do all that we do because of him. Lord, so we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.